plea, didn't seem to think that you could, in fact, devise a formal classification scheme to achieve that. Now, the United States, up to 1976, what is known as the Furman decision and its progeny, which were another five cases that are often ignored, but and people just say Furman, post-Furman, pre-Furman, definitely. It was all over the place, they said. You know, it was so capricious, so arbitrary, that as one justice put it, it was just downright free. It fell outside the boundaries of any classification process. Things were just discretionary, arbitrary, capricious, and free. But it was not unconstitutional to kill, just to do it in a capricious, arbitrary, and freaky manner. So let's be objective and rational. We will devise a formal classification scheme, and we will apply that formal classification scheme to the selection of the worst of the worst. We have two problems. Over here is the worst of the worst. Here are those that did the worst of the worst things, but for some reason ought not to be treated as if they did the worst of the worst things. So again, I, I think that I started splitting that one and didn't quite finish the split, because I'll go back now. You had statutory mitigators, A, the example I gave you. But you had non-statutory mitigators. That was a catch-all category. It said anything else that might encourage judge and jury to grant mercy. It was an open end to a classification system. Now, we know what happens to an open end. You know, you keep throwing stuff in until it gets unwieldy and there are too many exceptions to the rule and then you start trying to create more categories. Let me go back to that. On the other end, the aggravators how many ways can you kill a man, a woman, a child, a dog? How many ways can you do it? How can a classification system capture all the ways that you can kill? Well, obviously it could. But it captured some of them. So you'd have eight aggravators, ten aggravators, something else horrible would happen, you'd add another aggravator. But you couldn't keep doing that because the function of the formal classification scheme, its objectivity, was in the narrowness that the scheme was supposed to permit. It was supposed to allow you to capture only the worst of the worst. If you got open in on both ends, on the one hand, your bad guys are escaping off that end, and you're not getting them on this end. So you had an open-ended category over there as well. It said, kill in a cruel, heinous, depraved manner, showing indifference to human pain and suffering. No, 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 we didn't get anybody. But the problem with it is that they could get anybody. So how was that now? They could get anybody. So, of course, and I won't go through the history of what happened with that, but every one of those concepts, cruel, painless, depraved, has been split. There's the definitional battle over the four attributes of each one. And one of the results I'm going to read you from a 1993 amicus brief in the state of California, which was charging that that classification scheme was now capricious, arbitrary, and indifferent to the narrowness intent. Why? Because the amicus brief said, defendants said that the death sentence has been rendered for defendants because the defendant struck many blows and inflicted multiple wounds, or because the defendant killed with a single execution style wound. Because the defendant made the victim endure the terror of anticipating a violent death, or because the defendant killed instantly and without any warning. Because the victim had children, or because the victim had not yet had a chance to have children. Because the victim struggled prior to death, or because the victim did not have an opportunity to struggle before death. Now, these were actual cases. The point was that on the other side of the abolitionist battle was those who wanted the death penalty to kill all murderers. They didn't want these distinctions. And so the aggravator mitigator structure not only collapsed one aggravator into the other, producing these kind of paradoxes, but if I went on with 
this list, you would see that mitigators become aggravators. He received the death sentence because he was not yet 21, but had managed to kill five people. He received the death penalty because he was over 21 and should have known that. Okay? And so aggravators collapse in to mitigators. And this gets, oh, I didn't read the last one, which is, I think, also important. Because the defendant had a prior relationship with the victim, or because the victim was a complete stranger to the perpetrator. Okay? Now, you're trying to capture with these oppositions the ways in which people might kill, but you're also continually producing more and more opposition and then trying to make people fit into them. Ultimately, then, you close the open end for aggravators because it is more morally problematic. If you're going to take everybody in the kitchen sink, then let's just accept that formal scheme isn't working. But on the other end, can you say the same thing? Can you say, let's not consider X, Y, or Z as grounds for mercy? Preemptively, you're just not going to consider that. No, you can't do that either. But it means that in order to qualify for mercy, you must set a category. So the category must be continually adjusted because people have different experiences. Look, my father, not my father, I'm not blaming him. My father, let's see you, that took a two by four and beat me upside the head every day of my life after age six. Well, and so I went to the next one. But what if he only hits you every other day? And what if it wasn't your father, but your great uncle? Do you What if it's your mother that hits you? These are the ways then in which mitigation had to operate. It had to continually try to produce a form of personhood. Then it had to try to make that form of personhood fit the next case. And so you had no individuality, even though this was supposed to be a case by case. Um, case by case mitigation for mercy. This is how the system was working. This is how the system is working as human rights organizations confront Barbados with their one crime, one outcome, a mandatory death sentence. Already, they had agreed in 1998 to raise the age to the age that these organizations were fighting to get the United States to raise to. Um, so age wasn't something they could attack. But to change the classification system, some concept must be made vulnerable. You must get some hook into one of those little concepts and start beating the crap out of it. How do you do that if you have nothing? Murder. Are you going to say, we're going to redefine the murder concept? Well, they just said murder. They didn't even say first degree murder. So you can say, well, it should be second. It should only be third. They said nothing, just murder. Get your husband to that. One sentence, death. Not life without the possibility of parole, not natural life, not life until blah, blah. Just death. But there was hope on the horizon because in 1976, in Woodsby, North Carolina, 1977, in Robertson v. Louisiana, the United States Supreme Court has said, you must consider circumstances before you pass sentence. You cannot have a mandatory death sentence. It's inhumane. Barbados, old classification system, mandatory, one category, Belize, Guatemala. By the 1990s, the Inter-American Court had began to absorb this disdain for mandatory. Mandatory concept was on the run. It was a bad guy. Like race and gender and all this. It was a bad concept. It was wrong. So you make the attack on mandatory. But to let you to be clear that that's the only place you could attack mandatory. Mandatory was not just a bad concept out there in the world. Mandatory was bad only within the context of the mode of classification that required a bifurcation. And this concept was standing in the way of the range of, of, of classifications that were needed to begin to slice and dice offenses. 
circumstance, offender, and offended to produce the form of personhood as a predigested category qualified for mercy throughout the litigation process, not just at some point later called clemency. This had to be done throughout the process. Because in order to pass the sentence, you had to weigh and balance aggravation against mitigation. Now, you were not allowed to put down any points and add it up and say, oh, mitigation is way out there, uh, aggravation is up. No. It, was, it had to be subjective. The jury had to be subjective. The judge, if it was judge sentencing, had to be subjective. Now, you can see then that the system is collapsing back onto the very concept that it was in the run against. Discretion. And discretion became a synonym for the arbitrary. Barbados isn't permitting any of that. All, all, the, all, the, all the judges have to decide is, is there evidence to bring the case? You have the trial. Is he convicted? He's convicted. That's what The rest of what will happen to him, whether he will actually receive the death sentence, will depend on the governor general and the clemency process. This was not. This wasn't acceptable. So in appeal number 99, before the American, before the Inter-American Court in the 19, in 2001, beginning in the 1990s, with the court finding that the mandatory sentence following the USSC holding was in fact barbaric and inhumane. So here comes little Barbados with, haven't executed anybody now since 1984. It was at that point already a signatory to all of the human rights conventions. Um, it still had it in, in its constitution that it could, could carry out the death penalty, as did all the other countries that had signed on to these conventions that had a death penalty at the time. But now Barbados is in trouble because Barbados has nothing on which the classification process to get abolition of the death penalty can hook except mandatory. So with the court deciding that mandatory is any name, then the organization has a hook. The majority in Appeal 99 said, but wait a minute, we have a whole process here. We're not arbitrary and capricious. We have only one crime. You get a fair trial. Only if you're found guilty could you be sentenced to death. And, you, and the sentence is carried out only if you do not receive clemency. They said, no. You cannot do it that way because you're mixing functions. You're mixing an executive function with a judicial function. It didn't have the first prong to get the motor started. So I want to find, I want to find what the court said to the government when the government decided that it had a whole system. It wasn't arbitrary. And when all things were taken into consideration, it thought that it had a fair and just system, and in fact, if it started this process of bifurcation, it believed that it would be more inhumane. What crime circumstances it wanted to know? What kind of victims it wanted to know? In other words, it was asking all the questions that are in fact problematic for the mode of classification that was being promoted. Would you keep me in track of time, please? I don't want to, I don't want to see people who are going to be allowed to finish you. So here's what the board had to say to, to the government about its holistic system. The board is mindful of the constitutional provision governing the exercise of mercy by the general government. But it is not a sentencing function, and the advisory council is not an independent and impartial court. The administration of justice involves the determination of what punishment a transgressor deserves. The fixing of the appropriate sentence for the crime. The grant of mercy involves the determination that a transgressor need not suffer the punishment it, the, the punishment he deserves. That the appropriate sentence for some reason be remitted. The former is a judicial, the latter an executive. The opportunity to seek mercy from a body such as the advisory council cannot cure 
cure a constitutional defect in the sentencing procedure. In short, there was nothing for me to say. It could have marshaled evidence that every time someone came up for uh, clemency, they got it. It was They could have said that the judges always take in a whole list of considerations. It would not matter. Because the conjunction between objectivity and rationality for an outcome for this level of classification depends on having in place a formal classification scheme, and more important, one that is subject to a bifurcation process. That is made clear then by the dissent in the case. The dissent did not say that there was a problem with the constitutionality of the death penalty or of the death penalty. It said, the appellants do not in this appeal contend that it is contrary to the Constitution or Barbados, or, or Barbados for judges to pass sentence of death on those convicted of murder. And having considered, and this I have, this I have an italic here, this is their word. If having considered all the relevant circumstances pertaining to the offense and the offender, they consider such a sentence, such a sentence to be just. The appellant's challenge relates not to the imposition of the death penalty, but solely to the mandatory imposition of the death penalty. That is, the requirement that the judge must impose the death penalty in all cases of murder, irrespective of any, this again, these are accident words, irrespective of any consideration pertaining to the offense or the offender, which may serve to mitigate the seriousness of the crime to some degree. What they wanted, they made clear, you must produce forms of personhood, both as the offender and as the offended, that can be pre-digested prior to the trial, during the trial, and certainly prior to clemency. Only those forms of personhood can constitute the individual that Barbados claimed it was considering case by case. There's no individual. There are forms of personhood, and they must be properly constituted for a plea and the evidence requirement, which for over 300 years has been considered pleas that paint the structure of justice if they enter prior to conviction and sentencing. This process does not accept that, but instead thinks that it must be continually doubled and tripled throughout the process. Therefore, I want to say one last thing, and then it will explain my title. Reigning in barbarians, then, has two aspects to it, and I know they make me say three, but I'm going to stick with two. By reigning, I mean, as Julie Roberts Solomon argued in her book on making objectivity, in which she traces the history of the concept and vagueness founding of the scientific method. Royalty, which later became the state as taking over the royal prerogative, was the final arbiter of truth. But what happened when empiricism became the turn, in the 18th century, when we turn to empiricism, it was the travelers and the merchants and the commoners who had knowledge, experiential knowledge. How could the royalty, Solomon argued, be able to take advantage of this knowledge without undermining the credibility of the divine prerogative? They can self-distancing, creating a structure of self-distancing, she argues, the way of culling and mining this knowledge so that the cull was actually the knowledge that was true. The complexity of experience, the complexity and diversity of knowledge, that was the truth. Only when it was captured into this formal process, extruded out the other end of it, did the cult become knowledge. What we have in this mode of classification as it adopts this notion of a linkage between objectivity and rationality is what is left of the human concept as it comes in contact with all of these other concepts
products and their compounds. What is left is that which it can scavenge from all the other concepts around it. Human becomes the leftover of the other concepts in the classification process. But with that said, you can say the human as a scavenger, as, 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 scavenge, as scavenge material. But you cannot say a whole, a whole human in its complexity because they're bad. They're the worst of the worst. You must call out from them all the attributes that would otherwise make them unworthy of life. As a result, then, the reigning hand is in two ways. It's not even in the barbarians that are in this bit that aren't using the most classification, but it's also reigning in the process of producing concepts and categories such that the formal classification scheme becomes the means for discipline, disciplining the culling process that then constitutes the human and gives the human value. So that the struggle that I described about victims and the hierarchy of victims is a struggle over the value of life. It can all be claimed to fall within the conjunction sanctity of life. But the way in which you calculate the value of life is in a value-added process. Each one of these aggravators, and I can't go through all of them for you, so I'm only going to take one, is a value-added, value-subtracted process. A woman carrying a child, a pregnant woman, has double value. Therefore, an aggravator for a person who kills a woman who is pregnant is considered to be the highest value that you can attribute to life. Well, what if you kill a snake? Yeah, you know what a snake is. A universal language is somebody nobody likes. What if you kill a snake? What is the value of life? Well, then you've got to do a value-adding process. All the relatives of the snake have to come in and cry and plead. It's best if you bring in a picture of the snake as a child. So that, you know, it's about um, eight and a half by eleven glossies. Here you have the glossy of the person that was killed. Here you have the glossy of the person who did the killing at a moment before they were just a killer. And so you battle with these photographs. And the photographs are the glossy, value-added, value-subtracted process. And you have to do these in the order that the authorities that are banking this value allow you to do it. So, the, the mother of the murdered daughter gets to show her glossy before the mur mother of the, let's just say, 19-year-old who is going to be executed. And on it goes. So it's saying that Barbados is not putting its clemency process in the right place because it should be impartial. It's really illusory. Because if you go into a clemency hearing, this is what you will see. You will see a many repetitions of the entire litigation process and its problems. So first, in a trial, it divides into two. You have the finding part of the, the trial, and it's finding the evidence of guilt. The guilt phase is called. Then you have the sentencing phase. In the guilt phase, of course, you follow the rules of evidence and you present the evidence. In the mitigation period, you do, in the penalty phase, you represent this evidence and then you present mitigation. Statutory mitigation is usually, there's no need to present statutory mitigation for the most part because it's preemptive. But some of it, like mental retardation, which is also a continuum, you can do the battle of numbers. Is he a 63? Is he a 73? Somebody said he's a 59. You can do that part of it. Okay, so you do this, and then when you get to the clemency hearing, you repeat it. The prosecutor drags out all the horrors of crime, the defense drags out all of the mitigation, and then all the international agents get out. They get to follow the victims, family members, who get to say all the wonderful contributions that this person would have made had they not been cut down at whatever time in their life they were cut down. The defenders of the person who is asking clemency then get up and get to say this person should um, be able to contribute something to society or you know no longer dangerous, blah blah blah. blah. They get to say all these things, all these good things. And the international agencies get up and say, you know, America, you're a barbarian. You know, you're killing your own citizens. 
what's up with that, you know? All right. So that's what a real tendency hearing is like. Now, if you want to call that an impartial third body, that's what you get. Um, so, Barbados can hardly do worse than Bush's response when he was governor of Texas to Carl A. Tucker's plea for mercy when on national television he figured it took. That's money. That's the value of life. That's the mode of classification that allows us to understand that life is valuable. Life is precious. And Barbados is going to get it back together and learn how to treat life as if it were precious, or else it would just be killing people. Has it done so since 1984, but it's threatening to become a regressive state. Barbados' response to that is, I'm taking myself out of the game. I'm taking my two murderers, and I'm leaving the system. It has therefore moved to the Caribbean Court of Criminal Justice, the Caribbean Court of Justice, and already the abolitionists and other organizations are, even before the, the case had been heard, was defining this court as the hanging court, a barbarous, murderous hanging court, even though it had not heard a case yet, because of the fear of domino effect. If this court ruled in Barbados' favor, then it also meant the other constitutional monarchies that could no longer get their way with the Privy Council and remain a constitutional monarchy would change their constitutional status, not the constitutional, but their constitutional status, and move themselves under the CCJ, and therefore out of the reach of this particular mode of classification. If the CCJ does what it claims it's going to do, and I think it won't do it because I don't think it can, but it claims that it is going to ignore this distancing process, and you go to its website and read its exact wording, in favor of an interpretation of local values and local standards. By what mode of classification it will do that will determine whether or not it, as a court, remains an outlier and therefore a potential barbarian, or whether it comes into the mode and therefore serves no purpose for those that are brought to it for cover. Thank you very much.